All right, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, attending this talk. We are extremely excited to have Diana J. Leonard here with us. Um, I've known Diana for many years now, uh, have edited some of her work. I'm a huge, huge fan. And she always has um, basically some of the most cutting edge things to say about the way LARPers interact, the way that their brains work, the way that they experience uh, LARP. And she's gonna talk to us today about one of the most important topics I would say in, in what we do, which is um, how, what happens when we play the identity of someone else, particularly someone from an, a marginalized background that we don't share and um, how to do that in the most appropriate way um, and what are some of the pitfalls of that. So I would like to read her official bio for you. Um, let's see. Diana J. Leonard received her PhD in psychology at UC Santa Barbara in 2012 and is currently associate professor of psychology at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. While working on her PhD in an intergroup emotions lab, Leonard joined the Southern California Cinematic Bopper LARP community, where she currently serves as a storyteller and community manager for the post-apocalyptic LARP Apocalypse 47. Dr. Leonard's research agenda blends practice with scholarship. She applies social psychology theory and methodology to the study of LARP group dynamics. Meanwhile, as an educator and LARP designer, she uses elements of role play to empower students and LARPers alike to explore marginalized identities in and out of the classroom. And so we at the Transformative Play Initiative at Uppsala University are so excited to welcome Diana Leonard. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to share some of my research and thoughts with you today. I'll be starting with a little bit of personal stuff as well so that you can get to know me and where I'm coming from with this talk. And uh, I'm also just excited to have our conversation after the first hour, we'll be doing Q&A and discussion. And so I'm looking forward to that, especially as well. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so yeah, so the title of my talk today is Playing for Pain, Benefits, Pitfalls, and Strategy for Role-Playing Marginalized Characters. So we're going to go on a little journey together about where I came to be interested in this topic, some of my thoughts about it, and uh, especially thinking about some strategy, but by no means is this an end to the conversation. I'm really, and I'm also supposed to slow down, <laughs> I'm really interested in... Um, in hearing what other folks have to say and other people's experiences in these arenas. I know we have people here who are interested in run design games, folks who are academics, folks who do EduLARP. So this is such a great little um, workshop space that I'm so excited to be a part of. I wanna start with a quote from Octavia Butler and to bring her into this space, uh, somebody who I have not ever met, but who I feel has had an impact on the way that I think about stories. Um, she famously says, every story I create creates me, I write to create myself. And I think this is no less true of LARPing, collaborative storytelling, um, at least uh, especially when we're trying to push the envelope on understanding the world that we're a part of or possible worlds that we may never be a part of. And so to give you an overview of today's talk, I'm going to do a little bit of who am I, how do I LARP, um, and then touching on why. Why do we sometimes choose to play as marginalized others and uh, people who are experiencing marginalizations other than ourselves? Uh, what are the risks of that practice? What are some of the proposed benefits? Um, and this is where I'm going to bring in some of my psychology training, especially. Um, and how can we do this practice better um, as a community of LARPers across the world? And the lens I'm bringing in for today uh, is my background in applied social psychology. So I'm a social psychologist by training uh, with an experimental emphasis. Um, my research, as Sarah, uh, thank you for the lovely introduction, uh, stated was in intergroup relations, intergroup emotions, cognition, how this all affects things like the receipt of apologies between groups or whether and when people engage in collective action and so forth. Um, then um, I got interested in LARP 
staffing. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and started applying uh, that expertise to the study of LARP, uh, starting with small group dynamics and how they play out in LARP communities. Um, the neuroscience of bleed, um, which is the spillover between player and character and so forth. Um, so I also come from a basis in SoCal Cinematic Buffer LARP, although I have LARPed across the country in other formats. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about what that is and how it influences my thinking. Um, and I also in, I'm incorporating my experiences as a queer mixed race uh, POC living in the Pacific Northwest um, and working at a predominantly white institution. So this is all kind of who I am and what I bring to these ideas. So how I started LARPing, um, I've got to start here. Um, I went to UC Santa Barbara uh, for my graduate training and uh, it's a lovely place, California. I'd never lived in, I'm, I'm from New York City originally. I'd never been that far West really. Um, and beautiful near the beach, lovely mountain view. I didn't see much of any of it though because I spent a lot of my time in an indoor lab with no windows. Um, but when I wasn't doing that, um, I was LARPing. <laughs> and that's because um, uh, a couple years into my time there, I met my partner um, and we're celebrating our 10 year wedding anniversary just now. Um, and he had done some vampire LARPs and uh, he and I started this new game, Dying Kingdoms in Southern California, we were invited to go to. And just, I was very skeptical at first. And he said, well, you like costumes, you like uh, meeting new people, you like theatrical stuff, this is for you. And I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And I never looked back. So that was um, over 10 years ago now. Um, so imagine a baby LARPer. Um, oh yes, and I'm supposed to describe some images. So that was a key image of UC Santa Barbara campus, as well as me and my partner um, as the second image. Um, so imagine me, a baby LARPer, in my first game ever, uh, Dying Kingdoms in Southern California. Here's a picture of me. I'm in a, a very acrylic blue skirt and um, played an alchemist character. So I've got some baubles on my belt and um, not really knowing much about live action role play or the communities um, that are involved in it across the world. Just kind of dive it, like putting my toe in the water. And um, I'm bringing with me into these experiences a mix of identities. Uh, I have some privileged identities uh, and I have some marginalized ones. And when I say marginalized throughout this talk, I'm referencing uh, identities which are discriminated against, excluded, and invalidated by institutions and systems. Thank you. I will try to slow down. Um, so yeah, so these uh, these marginalized identities are things that we carry with us. They're lenses through which we see the world and can be impacted even when we're immersed in characters that have different identities and modalities. Um, and so themes that I experienced uh, from the jump, which touched on my identities were slavery, slavery, colonization, and compulsory heterosexuality. So these are three very uh, strong and intense challenging issues that were embedded in the stories of the LARP that I participated in um, that I didn't necessarily know about when I when I jumped in, um, but that my character and I had to interact with and engage with. And, and I'll just clarify a little bit more about what I mean by compulsory heterosexuality. In this case, even though we had queer writers and cast members and players, there really wasn't a lot of queer or any queer representation uh, at this LARP at the beginning. That changed over time, but it was very much something that uh, was not available for representation. Okay, so um, I'm sorry to have to do this, but I, uh, everything I prepared, I need to grab my laptop charger really quick because I'm in a different space than I usually am. But I'll let you gaze upon these photos and contemplate the identities um, that might have been represented here. So I'm gonna be right back real quick. And in the meantime, um, if people in the chat would like to share, uh, potent experiences that they've had playing marginalized identities um, briefly. That might be a nice way for us to, to share the space until she gets back. Okay, I'm back. Are you still seeing the thing? Somebody in the chat, let me know. Um, and so here we see uh, that in the 
In the time that I LARPed in Southern California, I was a dissident poet who used violence to achieve freedom for her people, an in over her head spaceship pilot whose fleet suffered heavy losses due to terrorism. That was actually in Michigan. Uh, a simple girl who turned out to have been created by a Fey Lord to hunt and kill for his amusement because Fey. <laughs> um, a male char character, ah, you're seeing Sarah's image instead of mine. So that's not an issue that I can be fixing on my end, but thank you for letting us know, Trey. Um, so, um, we'll, we'll work on it, just keep Okay, <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, maybe other folks click speaker view. Oh, and if you highlight my my video, Sarah, that should do it. Um, so a simple girl who turned out to, I already said that part, a mail carrier trying to survive and offer a ray of hope in the post-apocalypse context, a, um, a post-apocalyptic nightclub owner with dirty tricks under upper sleeves. Um, and so visually, uh, for accessibility purposes, you're just seeing a series of pictures of me in different costumes uh, representing these characters. I've also been uh, a droid, an AI program housed in a jukebox, and a therapist living on board a sentient spaceship whose patients consist of intergalactic refugees, just to name a few. So my LARPing experiences took me to all sorts of fantastical places and times and experiences. Um, and I mostly did this in the context of SoCal Cinematic Boffer LARP. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what that is. Um, you know, everybody, everybody's going to think that their own LARP community is really special and unique. Um, and so I don't claim that we're the only ones to have done these things. But this is what I mostly do when I say I'm LARPing. Um, we have long-term campaigns the last two to three years often where you play the same character every month or a couple of weeks. You may also participate in multiple of those LARPs. So you may have a few characters, storylines going. Um, we engage in community storytelling. Um, and so what I mean by community storytelling, it's collaborative, but we also have plot teams who have a lot of say and sway on what happens. But there's a mix of group and player stories. So there'll be like a meta plot that's going on um, in which the players can interact with an effect, but there's a kind of a plan, a loose plan. Um, I know this from also the storyteller side, um, but the players also develop their own intense, in many cases, story decisions and, and experiences uh, in the role play between each other. Um, that's not necessarily um, uh, controlled or engaged with by the main story team. Uh, we also have a revolving door between uh, players, cast, and storytelling in the community. So lots of people playing all these different parts over the, uh, the course of a game or over the course of a year. Um, we all often emphasize player versus enemy, so PVE. So we're each playing uh, our own narratives together as a community in the story, the in-character uh, experiences to try to defeat some big evil, <laughs> to bring peace to the world, to um, end slavery. So these are some of the experiences that we might have. It's very co connected and community oriented. There is an aspect of buffer and nerf combat, but it's not compulsory for the most part. A lot of people play crafters or just kind of hanging out as in character without engaging with those systems overtly too much. Um, and there can be political scheming involved um, as well as puzzles. So there's lots of different ways to engage with the story. Um, and that this puzzle aspect is gonna come up later. One thing that when I asked folks what was uh, unique to them about SoCal Boffer LARP, um, uh, one thing that came up was the pervasiveness of it. So the idea here is that uh, effectively, uh, we're not just telling the story in the so-called magic circle of the moment of game. This extends uh, beyond that to online engagement on Facebook groups, um, person to player to player, uh, storytelling in the form of letter writing, uh, chat RP, uh, lots of, great, uh, lots of uh, even uh, vignettes that are written or video recorded and uh, posted. So there's so many different ways in which we engage with story that extends beyond a given weekend at a campsite. All right, so that's the backdrop of what I've experienced. So that was that pervasive engagement piece. 
Um, for those of you who um, would like me to describe the photo, uh, here we see uh, it's a photo of a group of people standing in a, in a field uh, with a big tree uh, behind them, and they're all engaging in a giant group hug. Now, I will say this was before the time of COVID, so, uh, you know, I have anxiety too, so just uh, be aware this is before COVID. Um, and we have one player off to the background by, alone by themselves as well. Um, and this is an example of a puzzle that involved that in a very, you know, nerf combat context, heavy context in the post-apocalyptic LARP that I help run, uh, where the, the, the astral beings, the spirits were riled up and not getting along, and it was, it was putting everything out of balance with the elements, and the player's way of resolving that puzzle was to show these elemental spirits the power of love and basically that you could come together and resolve your differences. Uh, so this was uh, absolutely uh, one example of how this can be a community effort to resolve the meta plot. But I also want to talk a little bit about my experiences exploring marginalization in game. Um, I want to comment on how, as, as a social psychologist, I'm aware of issues of intergroup relations and identity, but I don't always think explicitly in those terms in my own lived experiences, right? You turn that off, you take off that hat, you're just kind of going through your life. Um, so some of this wasn't necessarily intentional, or I'm not sitting there and thinking, given my social psychology knowledge, what should I do to explore my queer identity? However, um, I do have these experiences and then I'm able to reflect on them. So in one example, um, I played a character who I mentioned who was the girl who was uh, created by the Fey Lord. Um, on the left here, there's an image of, uh, or on the right, there's an image of two uh, female presenting characters leaning towards each other uh, with their heads pressed to each, uh, each other's foreheads. Um, and I, uh, my character had a whole lot of stuff going on with that whole, I was created to, to hunt and kill, but I want to protect instead. Um, my friend Autumn played a uh, sort of a dark elf character who was grappling with trying to bring peace to her people um, and accept her identity and her cultural norms and beliefs in the context of a sort of a globalized uh, social network. So there was a lot going on with our backstories. And we developed an organic in-character romantic relationship as well, which was impacted a lot by the meta plot events, um, but also impacted by uh, by erasure, where our characters weren't necessarily considered to be together at first glance, even though we were physically <laughs> together, um, people would just kind of, uh, at least one person would ignore that and ask very weird questions that made it clear that they had no idea that this was a relationship, whereas um, it seemed obvious uh, to us. So this experience of marginalization was something that in this context I was able to explore uh, that as somebody who is um, in a st uh, straight appearing marriage uh, don't experience in everyday life. Um, so this, I wanted to bring in this example because I think it demonstrates the opportunities to experience marginalization that um, kind of uh, flows between the in-character and out-of-character experience uh, in interesting ways and also allows uh, players to unpack their own marginalizations, uh, but in ways that they may not readily experience and to connect with their communities to unpack their identities uh, through LARP. I think it's really powerful. I think it's amazing. It's a form of transformation. And there's been research out there, some really excellent work by Jenea Kemper, uh, also from SoCal originally, um, but not originally, we're both from the East Coast, but from the SoCal LARP community. Um, and she has some excellent work out there about marginalized individuals and how we can use LARP to deconstruct our own oppression. Uh, she draws on um, excellent research um, and past work on double uh, consciousness, for example, to look into the idea that uh, LARPers uh, with any form of marginalization do experience, uh, have the opportunity to uh, kind of peel back the layer of what is our oppression in everyday life through playing these characters in LARP. For example, um, somebody who would be denied socially uh, the opportunity to be uh, an advanced professional, like an academic, a doctor, and who don't, somebody who doesn't see themselves in those roles and identities can play that character in LARP. And because of the shared agreement that we're imagining a world together, as a result, 
people will just accept that that person is in that role as doctor um, and so forth. And through that experience, the marginalized larva can come to realize that there's really nothing but a social barrier. These are real social barriers, intense pressures, but that those things are constructed. They're fake, just like the story in the LARP. Uh, and it can unpack our ability to, uh, to expand our lives outside of the game as well, in the story. Uh, but this process takes work. And so Kemper recommends a couple of practices, including pregame prep, uh, In-game steering, and steering is a word that mostly means um, you're going to lean into character choices and story uh, arcs and moments that would allow you to explore uh, what you're interested in uh, rather than letting it happen organically. So steering can be controversial when some people think that uh, it's more important to have an organic story that develops without intention, uh, kind of clouding it. Well, Kemper recommends steering uh, if you want to explore oppression and post-game reflection. And Kemper has done some uh, work on autoethnography, especially the visual kind. So here you see there's a picture of a fan and a book and some paper and clothing. Um, and this is her approach to uh, thinking about bringing together the ephemera that comes with the character and mm, journaling essentially about what your experience has been in this game, in this story. Um, and there's also a picture of Jenea and I've put uh, her Kofi account if you want to buy her a coffee or check out her website, which is linked on there. She's done some really great work in this area and needs to be recognized. Um, and uh, so I want to talk about my own experience in this context with the example of emancipatory bleed uh, in Undying, which is another LARP in SoCal. Um, and actually, in 2018, I had the honor of portraying uh, the mortal mayor of this setting um, as it was first being um, released into the world, this game. Um, so this was the first Undying LARP event, and I got to help establish its uh, sort of um, panel of important characters and political figures. Um, and Jenea actually is the one who messaged me at six in the morning my time uh, to gush about casting me as this NPC or cast member she had written. Um, and I couldn't help but gush with her, but I was also nervous because the setting is um, kind of complex, but it's like an undie, undead um, setting based in Americana. Uh, iconography, and the character that I was playing is part of um, a group that draws a lot on the real world culture of Louisiana and practices of uh, Vodou. And so this is a spiritual and cultural connection that I do have historically. I have Creole heritage, I have ancestry who practiced uh, Vodou, Vodou, but I don't have a personal lived experience with that heritage, if that makes any sense, um, in part because it was sort of rooted out by in my family's parentage. Um, in my dad's side of the family, they kind of like cut it off at a certain point and wouldn't transmit the culture. And so for me, it was a great opportunity to reconnect with the cultural heritage that I care about. Um, but at the same time, there were concerns that I might be appropriating a culture that's truly not mine anymore, uh, or doesn't, isn't in my family anymore, uh, portraying it incorrectly, engaging in uh, behaviors that could be considered taboo because of the spiritual component. Um, in this context, I was able to work with Jenea, who also has similar ancestry in that sense to me, uh, and has more direct cultural connections. And so that was really exciting, but I could see where this could, and, and I got positive feedback on the portrayal and everything, but I could see where this could be problematic if I didn't have that staff support, those direct connections to the culture to make sure that I was doing an accurate and sensitive portrayal. And so I wanna to touch on this question before I launch too much into the rest of my content, which is um, when we're choosing to play characters who are marginalized, um, we, we may uh, be excited to portray a character from a culture that we're, we feel an even an affinity to. If we don't have a direct con connection or lots of historic knowledge, we may uh, trend in the wrong direction. Um, and so in a, few, in a few slides, I'm gonna be talking about uh, this. Uh, I, was, I participated in a panel from Life Action Roleplay, which is a LARP podcast. Um, but we do, a, they do a Twitch stream um, via, and then it's available on demand. So if you're interested, um, definitely check it out on twitch.tv slash live, life action role play. 
Um, and so what's visualized here is a picture of all the panelists, including myself and another panelist uh, from Indigenous uh, heritage named Kelly Lynn D'Angelo. So in a few slides, I'm going to be doing a lot of quotes from her. But she asked the question, how much you can, or sorry, Kai Norman asked the question of the panel, how much should you consider if things are an open wound? Meaning, uh, when we're thinking about portraying marginalized characters, should we consider uh, that some cultures are in particular oppressed today, erased today, disempowered in our own communities, um, and maybe uh, we should uh, check our intentions and potentially restrain from portraying those characters at all um, directly. Um, so there's a difference here. When I'm talking about exploring marginalized experience, I'm mostly suggesting that we're playing um, in ways that can touch on those experiences without directly mimicking them or portraying them. So uh, a cultural analog um, in a post-apocalyptic context, in a futuristic setting, in an alternative world, in you're not portraying a mestizo um, Chicano character, but you're portraying someone who has maybe some similar experiences of marginalization. Um, and then that would be a safer, more effective way to play for marginalization. So, um, but let's get into it. Why would we do this at all? Um, and why, why do I do it when I do? Um, and so we can unpack some of the reasons, and this is going to be very surface, but I just wanted to touch on why people get excited to explore marginalized experience. And this includes curiosity and play. So Tannenbaum and Tannenbaum are some authors who have looked into transformative uh, role play, and they view play as a transformative experience, um, and it's a resource really in our lives that we can discover new worlds and reconsider our current perspectives. Um, so this is one way, curiosity, playing around with possible futures, possible selves. That's absolutely part of the human experience, and Vygotsky even claims, psychologist even claims that it's a vital part of the human psychology. Um, so absolutely. Uh, and then there's also the, con the concepts of um, the reasons why people engage in role play in general. Uh, sometimes uh, there, there's this model, the threefold model, that there's a gamist mode, a simulationist mode, and a narrativist or dramatist mode. Um, some, some folks see these as opposing uh, concepts that you can only have one mode or that they kind of drive each other away. Um, I argue that you can have all three at the same time or lean into a couple more than the other, but, but this is gonna vary from person to person, from this moment to moment. Social psychology is the study of the person and the situation. So we're always saying things are fluid, things are gonna change. Um, but here we see that um, people might be interested in personal achievement uh, through the gamist mode. They might be interested in uh, immersing themselves in contexts uh, that are, and, and just feeling the character's story organically um, uh, in the simulationist mode, or they might be interested in conveying story and uh, the telling, telling, collaboratively telling a story in the narrativistic mode. This is all very surface that I'm explaining this if you're not familiar with these models, but I did want to touch on how um, I think that the simulationist mode is likely one of the most important uh, areas for playing as marginalized experience, because these folks might be interested in just immersing themselves in other lives, and that relates to me as a psychologist to perspective taking, uh, the idea that we can um, improve our understanding of the world and each other by taking on the perspectives of those other than ourselves and immersing into them. And that's, I feel like the simulationist mode touches on that, but we can also think of ways that these other modes could interact with marginalized role play. Um, another area to look at is just generally transformation and personal growth. So wanting to, let's say, uh, know about other lived experiences, wanting to flex our role play abilities outside of our comfort zone um, might take us down the path of playing identities other than our own and marginalized experiences that are unfamiliar to us. Uh, and then also, like I already mentioned, perspective taking and empathy. And this is, this is something that I'm vastly interested in um, as a psychologist. So to tease these two apart, perspective taking is kind of the cognitive mode. You're thinking thoughts like the other person. You're, you're kind of thinking what would be their everyday experience? Uh, what, how would they perceive the world? And empathy is the emotional component, feeling emotions as that person would. Now we know that um, from research um, in social psychology and other fields that perspective taking and um, empathy, so thinking on behalf 
behalf of the other and feeling on behalf of the other can be really effective in reducing prejudice. Prejudice being this affective component of bias where we may feel negative emotions and evaluations about group, other groups. Uh, stigmatized groups in society, for example. But the research also shows that this can be a flawed process. Essentially, if you're engaging in perspective taking and empathy with very little research and planning, well, you're just reinforcing and reproducing the cultural norms, stereotypes, and expectations you've been fed by the media, by family, and peers. So it's kind of this two-part process where, yes, putting yourselves in the shoes of others will reduce prejudice and improve humanization. You'll see their experiences as real and, and, and offer them support. Maybe even it can lead to pro-social behavior and helping and altruism over time. And that's all really great. But it can also be through this lens of what you expect them to think and what you expect them to feel. And it can reinforce those stereotypes because if you've role played it for a couple of days even, now it feels even more true to you. But, and you're sharing that experience with others who are going to also have those stereotypes reinforced. So it's this two pronged thing where you can get the positive benefits of prejudice reduction, but it can come with this thorny side of reinforcing, in many cases, negative stereotypes. And I wanna take a moment to also comment on how even positive stereotypes. Um, so if you're like, but I'm only playing the positive sides of what I expect this group to feel or think, even positive stereotypes can take a toll on members of stigmatized group um, groups. Um, they can feel pigeonholed uh, into being a certain kind of person. Uh, they, you know, we have like the model minority stereotype, which can be really harmful to self-esteem, well-being, and just feeling like uh, a person has been seen by their community. Um, and we're going to get more into some of the other downsides of the flaws of playing marginalized folks in a minute, but I just did want to highlight the perspective taking and empathy is not always going to be a perfect uh, outcome here. Um, but there are also community-wide benefits in cultural understanding that can occur when this role play is done effectively and accurately. And so it can be um, a community-wide benefit, but again, must be done carefully. Um, and we also know that empathy is a thing, like this kind of relates to all of these, especially transformation and personal growth and the community-wide benefits. But practicing empathy, it's like a muscle. Over time, we become more effective at feeling for other people, more likely to help and engage in pro-social behavior maybe we'll take on their plight and their, uh, their struggle and be more likely to engage in collective action, activism, to try to uh, address wrongs and harms to that community. So definitely there can be really positive uh, benefits of marginalized experience role play. Um, and so back to uh, the panel that I mentioned, um, I wanted to foreshadow that because I think it's important to be intentional with what we do play. Um, so here we see um, there's a small uh, picture of Kelly Lynn D'Angelo, who was on that panel and was responding to Kai Norman's question about how much should you consider if things are an open wound. Um, and her response was like, I'm going to be real. And then she said, everything native right now, take it out of your mindset. And so she's referring to indigenous identities um, in North America in this case, but we can think about other identities uh, that she could be, that this could relate to as well. She says, take it out of your mindset because first you have a lot of work to do if you are not native, you just do. You intrinsically have to teach yourself in a totally different perspective. Get some history in there because you've been raised in condition to think in a very specific way. You've been told very specific things growing up. Unless you went out of the way to try to inform yourself of a new perspective on history, you really need to get some context in terms of where this is coming from and why it is harmful to a living people that are breathing today. My family, my cousins on the res, it is so so important first to work on that. And she continues and says, we have no seat at the table yet to even begin these discussions. Uh, so any appreciation of us has to come from a completely different space. If you want to celebrate us, first step back and think of all of the elements. In this case, she had already referenced um, headdresses, eagle feathers, and dream cast catchers as things that people tokenize about indigenous uh, role play. Um, and Google them. Do some research on each one of those elements. Learn about their sacredness. Learn about the reason why it hurts us that people continue to wear them and can continue to put that out in the world. 
She continues, and this is the last part of the quote, then if you really want to start to incorporate us and appreciate us, what you can do and what you should do is, I think, is support Native creators. Not only are you appreciating the current living culture that we are a part of, but you are also contributing to artists and creatives in that space. Now, in this example, she was speaking about physical artists, those who create um, artwork and, for instance, beadwork that someone might um, purchase and assemble themselves or purchase already completed and put as part of their um, costume. And um, I would add, though, and I'm going to add later on again, that we can think about this broad, in a more broad sense as contributing to artists who are game designers, game writers, bringing them in more so, funding their work, um, and making sure that we're bringing um, artists from marginalized communities uh, into the highest, uh, the biggest rooms where things are happening in LARP. So to summarize what I, I got out of Kelly Lynn's comments were that if you want to play a culture that is incredibly oppressed right now in the world, to take a step back, to stop and check your assumptions, uh, do the research, explore why and whether elements that you might be considering using are used harmfully by others, explore the true history and current meaning of those elements, whether these are physical um, crafts that you would be using in your costume or practices that you would be role-playing and incorporating the work of creatives in the community uh, into your attempts. Uh, but <laughs> while attending to the labor costs this incurs, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, and again, go back again, and again, checking your intentions and what you're trying to get out of this and how you can also support the marginalized people in your life or in the world that you're role-playing as. And so this brings me to some drawbacks to LARPing as a marginalized character. Um, this includes violating taboos. So in this case, uh, we could, even with our best intentions, misuse culture, pro cultural products despite genuinely good intentions. Um, and so we're doing this in a way that could happen in uh, LARP communities and not in a vacuum, right? So um, these can be reproduced uh, via photos or via just folks who attend those LARPs can see us violating those taboos and either perpetrate that themselves thinking that it's okay, or if they're from the communities that are affected, um, could feel uh, uh, disaffected, alienated from the LARP, which I'll get to as well. Um, so misleading and under-informed portrayals can reinforce stereotypes in our, our own minds and in our communities. Uh, and this can be a problem which has ripple effects, right? Um, and I think that one of the fixes to this can also create more problems. And that's a kind of, I'm, I'm offering solutions in some cases, but this is it's a, a hard nut to crack because effectively what you would say is like, okay, well, I'm going to go to my member of my community who's part of this marginalized culture and ask them and say, how, how should I portray this character? Um, or I have these ideas, how are these looking to you? Are these right? And we can do this with the best of intentions, but they still can create harm because you're drawing on community resources, right? So you're pulling on either fellow players or staff members who have limited time and energy, and we're draining them of these, resource in ways that could um, prevent others from getting that help and that support. Um, over time, this can take a toll on marginalized LARPers. So imagine, you know, we each think that we're the one person going to that member of the community and asking for support. Um, but imagine that everybody who wants to play a marginalized character goes to these individuals, especially when we don't have very diverse LARP communities. Um, maybe there's a couple of people who are um, vaguely people of color, and then they get every request to vet their uh, character ideas and costumes, even from tangentially related cultural experience. Um, this can cause those players to feel tokenized, to feel um, exhausted, um, because they're engaging in high costly labor. And I want to break this down a little bit more and spend a little bit of time on this, because Essentially, whenever somebody's being asked to um, 
process or go through or give advice about character choices or role play choices around their own marginalization, they have to steal themselves. They have to prepare to potentially experience microaggressions. These are uh, small experiences of being invalidated or erased or um, even uh, explicitly discriminated against. Um, and they're called microaggressions, not because they have a small toll, but because they each are like, it's death by a thousand cuts. You get uh, one here, one there, and over time, um, you're bleeding all over, right? Not the good kind of bleed that we talk about with LARP, um, but uh, you are exhausted um, by just, just the cognitive and emotional toll it takes to prepare for such a conversation and engage in that conversation while not, by, while managing the emotions of yourself and others. This is labor um, that is unpaid in our communities, much like a lot of the labor that we do in LARP communities, thanks to uh, Kat Jones and Evan Turner um, and their co-author uh, for a really beautiful piece about labor in LARP. If you haven't checked that out, it's absolutely great. It's on Evan Turner's website. Um, I think the LARPer in the black hat .com, something like that. And uh, effectively, this idea drawn from Hostiles and others in sociology, Thank you, Sana Kowalu is the co-author, thank you. I don't know that person personally, so the name doesn't stick, but, um, but absolutely. And the, um, the amount of emotional labor that we engage in um, in LARP is monumental and uncredited in many cases. And this is no less true of marginalized individuals because of these situations that unfold. So I did wanna take a moment to kind of touch on that some more. Um, and overall, all of these things I've been talking about can alienate mar marginalized LARPers, right? You come into LARP, you see your community's symbols uh, being portrayed incorrectly. You see folks engaging in maybe casual role play around themes that are part of your lived experience of generational trauma. People ask with good intentions, the ones you trust, your allies ask you if they're doing it wrong, but you have to kind of engage in those conversations carefully. So that on the one hand, you're not just giving them a and saying like, yeah, it's fine, um, which can come back to haunt you when other community members could say, uh, because the person could say, well, I talked to somebody and they said it was okay. And now your name is on that. Um, or, you know, you're engaging in the conversation in a way that doesn't spark defensiveness or result in the person not listening fully to what you have to say. So there's so many different ways in which this process with good intentions, uh, the best of intentions can still undermine um, the feel of community safety for members of these marginalized groups to the point that we might leave the community, which is already um, in many ways not fully diverse to begin with. Um, I'm gonna speak about this a little bit too. Um, taken together, the uh, drawbacks of this could create what's called a chilly climate. So Claude Steele um, is a social psychologist in my field who studies the impact of sort of a constellation of factors in a community space, in a workspace um, that can lead to underrepresented group members just feeling um, vigilant for cues that they're unsafe and um, overtaxed by worrying about incoming microaggressions and, and slights. Um, so for example, women and racial minorities in higher education often accrue enough of these kind of slings and arrows um, that they pull back, they, they start to dampen their identification with that role or that field, or in this case, with the community of LARP. Um, and so in, in that research, uh, women and underrepresented minorities will abandon careers they were once passionate about. Um, so for example, engineering and math are, um, have been studied as a huge example of this and research by Adams and colleagues. So likewise, LARPers with marginalized identities who are having all of these experiences may seek short-term disengagement from the community that can lead to long-term alienation and withdrawal, um, especially if they think that um, their pain has been commodified for others' curiosity, right? So given all of this, like I did talk, so I'm confusing you, right? I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, LARPing is marginalized characters. I've done it. It's been great for me. And here's all the really great reasons why we could do it, but here's all the problems with it. Um, and it kind of leaves you wondering, why should we ever do this at all? Can we ever truly balance these costs and benefits? And indeed, um, I, I 
I'm biased here as a psychologist uh, who teaches research methodology um, every year. Um, I'm constantly reminded of the ethics code that psychologists um, swear by and must in, um, internalize, which uh, is the APA or the American Psychological society's code associations code of ethics um and this you know this is a complex document that has gone through many iterations has its roots in um the the belmont code which was originally um a code of ethics that was created at least in the u.s and reactions to the tuskegee syphilis study so this was a ongoing um, multi-decade uh, study in which they allowed Black men to persist in suffering from syphilis without treatment, even once penicillin was discovered to be an effective treatment, for the purposes of just seeing how untreated syphilis plays out, much longer than the scientific community now believes that study was necessary, if it was necessary at all. This study is a really good example of how we can consider the ethics of our behavior, though, because they were engaging in it for whom, right? Who was going to learn from this study? And was the juice worth the squeeze, so to speak, on what more they could add to the knowledge of the community, in this case, mostly white male scientists at that time, um, was that worth the suffering of these um, oppressed, uh, stigmatized individuals who themselves could also, um, through their deaths or through transmitting the disease, affect their greater communities also under oppression in the US society. So we can think about how this study, which was awful and unnecessary, um, and was only stopped because of a whistleblower, because somebody took it upon themselves to tell the world that it was going on, that this study um, is the basis or is one reason why we as a scientific community reaffirm the values of uh, that I'm going to explain now. This idea that we must do more good than harm, right? We, we need to strive to consider, and yeah, it's a little bit mechanistic, but a cost benefit analysis. Is the benefit of the knowledge maybe in this case, the empathy um, improvement, increase improvement, um, outweighing the potential harms to those folks whose identities are being portray portrayed or the community at large. Um, how are you attending to respect for dignity? Um, and in this case, um, the idea here that, um, and this is kind of an interesting um, resource, Sagang um, in 2018, S-A-G-E-N-G, wrote about whether or not kill, uh, killing fictional characters in video games is permissible. Um, if you're playing the game, you're killing pixels, it's not real, but is this something that we should consider unethical or ethical? Um, they argue that um, it is not unethical because it's make-believe harm, but that engaging in racism in character in a video game would be unethical because it has a real world impact because it impinges on members of the groups uh, who have a right for dignity, a right to see themselves as worthy of self-esteem and value. Um, and so when we're weighing, and you may or may not agree with their analysis, but uh, at the very least, it's a starting point for thinking about where we could draw the line in what kind of role play choices and design choices we make. Um, so this idea that respect for dignity, which also is affirmed by the APA ethics code, is absolutely uh, should be at the center of our thinking when we're developing uh, LERP design or planning our character portrayals. Um, and then finally, an emphasis on justice. And justice in this case is who gets to tell the story and who gets to learn from it, which I foreshadowed when I talked about the Tuskegee uh, study. Right? Um, are we bringing in voices from the marginalized communities into the story room, into the design room, into the backstage, um, and in throughout the whole process from start to finish? Or are we just pulling them in as consultants at the end? Is that sufficient? And then who is benefiting from this work that we're doing? Um, who's learning from it? Is this just a playground for the privileged to experience marginalization? Uh, or is this um, going to be accessible and available to all kinds of people who might learn from the LARP, the module, the story? So 
Um, I'm going to ask Sarah to tell me how I'm doing on time. I have a clock here, but I just want to double check. So when you get a chance, let me know. You have and, nine minutes left okay, for perfect. Until Q&A. We can do it. We can get there. Okay. <laughs> so I want to give an example. And I'm really being vulnerable here because this is something that I uh, developed in my role as storyteller for Apocalypse 47 before I was working on this work. So this is not informed by this. So it's kind of like I'm looking back and saying, how did I do? I don't think I did that great. And so I want to, but I want to talk about that. Um, I think it was okay. <laughs> but in this case, I was inspired by a fellow LARP scholar and designer, uh, Gabriel de Los Angeles, who put, made a post about how we can incorporate um, educational and pedagogical um, design into our LARP writing and how can we use uh, intentional storytelling and learning outcomes in order to um, share stories of marginalized cultures. And so I, I had that principle in mind, um, at the very least when I did this uh, SoCal Railroad mod for the Apocalypse 47 LARP. In this LARP, many of the uh, LARP uh, players, the participants are um, fairly privileged white Americans, although we do have um, several uh, players of, uh, of color and from non-privileged class backgrounds and a very queer forward community. Um, this game is set in the 1980s. Well, it's set in post-apocalypse in the future, like like way in the future. But um, in this storyline, the 1980s culture like stagnated. So it's kind of like a fusion of 1980s pop culture references and a post-apocalyptic setting. But with a kind of lens towards, we're gonna, we're, we, the players are trying to, or the players are trying to bring peace and happiness more so than being like gritty survivors. Yes, they're gritty survivors to an extent, but they're doing it through, you know, positive concepts of cooperation and love um, for the most part, with some like casual use of bombs also. <laughs> um, but in this storyline, I wanted to share with folks um, something that was meaningful to me. I'm just a few generations removed from enslavement in the U.S., transatlantic chattel slavery. And um, so I wanted to have a puzzle that related to the uh, practice that enslaved people engaged in to uh, communicate using quilts, uh, um, an artisanal kind of code, if you will, to try to share to people how to escape to freedom. Um, so these quilts would have things like little images on them that people would know, enslaved people would know uh, through um, word of mouth meant things like, this is a safe house or go north, or this house is no longer safe. Um, and so in doing this, I actually brought in uh, these children's books because in the setting, most of the characters aren't fully literate. So, um, but there is like a black market of um, books and stuff, but they're usually comic books and kind of like lower reading levels. So I thought this would be perfect. I recruited my friend Z, who is actually a elementary school teacher to come in playing a character who's like researching this uh, practice and historic practice, pre-fall, pre-apocalypse practice. And so she's got these books in her arms arms um, and is bringing them around and they're sharing the resource with the players like have you seen this do you do you know where this do you see more of this so this was the context in which I tried to introduce this story and infuse this into the setting because the setting does have uh, slavery, um, but it's bandit slavery, which is not race based um, and is capitalist based essentially or trying to um, just use people to make money in a post apocalyptic context It's something you can't really get away from in post apoc but I wanted to infuse some realistic um, understanding of what enslavement was like in the US history on the soil on which we were telling the story. Um, so I'm going to use this as a quickly an example to go through different harm mitigation and boosting benefits um, practices that I would like to offer. Um, and so one of these is transparency and opt-in. I think at minimum designers need to uh, make make it clear to part participants that they're going to be experiencing, if the story requires them to, experiencing a marginalized um, identity. That way they can prepare and they can opt in. And you won't have folks who are detracting from those experiences and the high level that can be engaged in. Um, so in this case, it was an opt-in mod. Uh, people kind of could see what was going on. I didn't have like a primer or a brief or a little like 
morning. This mod is going to have this this thing, but we tried to make what it was about pretty clear up front with the cast member who introduced the content. Um, and this piece we did not have as much as I would like, right? I'm, I'm going back now and looking at something I did before I was thinking about all of this. Um, preparation and scaffolding on the part of both the designers and the players. What are the experiences that are going to be role played? Um, how can participants think through the gravity of these experiences? So rather than um, going and being like, I'm gonna play somebody who's enslaved, how fun they're thinking through like, well, what, what will I have gone through? What will I be worried about? What are some uh, narratives I can read by folks who have maybe experienced modern uh, enslavement um, and how those experiences impacted them? So that rather than um, going in with your expectations and stereotypes, not even thinking about it, you're able to have a more accurate portrayal. And I think attention to intersectionality. So attending to the fact that yes, my players uh, are for the most part white and privileged, but um, I could be touching on experiences that they've had or are connected to um, of marginalization that I'm not realizing as I'm glancing at them in a very surface way. Uh, so thinking about how I can help them lean into emancipatory bleed, for instance, Kemper's model um, that I introduced before using this mod and not just assuming what each player is bringing to the table and that they're not going to be affected by my content. Um, and then imposing reflection during and after, opportunities to journal, opportunities to talk about what they're experiencing both in character as well as in debriefs. Not something that we do as much as in um, other communities in SoCal Boffer LARP. Um, it's something that I wanna bring in more. We do have the Facebook group and opportunities to talk about what our authorial intent was and ask players what they got out of it. And I also debriefed with uh, select players uh, in informal one-on-one -on -one context, but I would like to have offered people maybe prompts for autoethnography uh, to reflect on what they got out of uh, learning about this practice and uh, how it impacted the way that they think about um, enslavement overall. And then finally, and I'm gonna kind of gloss over this a little bit, but paying attention to relevant factors. Um, and so that's really broad, right? But I think that there are a few things that we can consider as impacting the, the value or the outcomes of role-playing as marginalized other. So one of them is um, kind of controversial with the idea is like, is this better suited to a small, like two hour experience in a conference room? Or is this something that you should only attempt in a long term campaign where you really have the trust of your fellow players and uh, a strong embedded sense of that character? Does it matter? Um, some research would suggest that repeated exposure to perspective taking on the same marginalized identity will accrue longer term benefits, but that, that isn't super empirically supported. So this is all speculation right now, but at the very least, considering the modality and the time frame um, and trying to steer towards the benefits inherent in the one you're using, I think would be really important. Um, also, what type of role are they playing? So there's been some research on perspective taking that has shown that taking on the perspective of the, uh, an elderly person and simulating their day-to-day -day experience can improve humanization of the elderly and positive regard towards them, but playing a role like a caretaker doesn't have the same strong effects. So really thinking like, am I putting them in the, like in this example, I didn't put them in the role of the enslaved person. They were just playing their characters and discovering these quilts and kind of following the, the chain of the puzzle to meet the community um, that's fight at the uh, sort of um, underground railroad style uh, community that's trying to free enslaved people who are enslaved by the bandits in the setting. So maybe that disconnect kind of cut off their ability to truly empathize and deeply immerse into what I wanted them to, to learn. Um, or maybe just learning about the practice was enough for that mod, right? So it's, what are your intentions? What are your goals? And are you actually attending to what role you're putting people in? And if that's going to do it. For another example, I participated in a um, experience where I was the therapist on board of a ship that was collecting refugees from planets as they were being destroyed. Um, and all the other players were more or less fresh from having been rescued and experiencing strong in-character emotions. I feel that more scaffolding could have helped them to more accurately portray those responses. 
Um, but from my part as a therapist, I was kind of just there helping them process. And yes, that was an experience, but I was more cut off from the refugee experience because I was in that role, right? With a lot of like clear cut goals and outcomes and things I should be paying attention to. And maybe that could also have limited my depth of immersion. So there's some VR data that suggests that the more immersive the role, the simulation, the more these benefits of perspective taking and empathy accrue. Um, I'm not saying we need to be strapped into a VR machine. As you all likely know, uh, we can immerse with a, just like a black box and wearing all black. But uh, at the very least, the level of immersion, more immersion, um, whether you're doing it because you're experienced and effective at being able to drop into character or because the environment is helping you to get there, um, is likely to be more beneficial for perspective taking and empathy, at least. So to conclude, LARP has the power to transform, and that's beautiful. It can transform individuals, communities, and society if we let it. But we have a responsibility to use this tool of transformation with intentionality, and we need to use it ethically, and we need to use it in collaboration with those it impacts. Uh, so I I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say about these topics, and um, I saw some really um, nice stuff in the chat already with folks sharing out, so let's continue that conversation now. But before we do so, I do need to thank my collaborators at the Lewis and Clark College uh, Lab of Emotions and Social Identity and Psychology, particularly Max Usman and Jovo Janjetovic, who has been uh, both of them have been helping me mostly on this project, but we have a full lab of undergraduates who are really passionate and exciting and keep me motivated to do this work. And then finally, my ludography of the games that I referenced um, more heavily in this talk. And that's it. Thank you. Hello. Wonderful, Diana. Thank you so much for that. Um, let me go ahead and stop the recording here. Um, okay, so um, there has been some sharing in the chat. Um, I'd like to focus on Q&A. And so if you do have a question for Diana, please put it in the Q&A with one caveat. <laughs> she just explained to us very beautifully why it is a lot of labor to try to vet whether or not one person's portrayal of a certain character or a certain LARP, whether that is okay or not. So please don't ask questions like that. Instead, perhaps focus on the overall concepts that we've been talking about, empathy and perspective taking and um, any clarifying details that you might uh, want to know about the content that she presented in the talk. And so uh, Hannah asked early on, uh, hi, it's great to hear you talk, Diana. Maybe this question comes too early, but so far it seems like you think it's mostly beneficial uh, for people who already have marginalized identities to play these kinds of characters. I think it's going to be down to the individual's uh, experience at that time in their life. Um, as a social psychologist, like I've said, uh, we look at the interaction between the person and the situation, and I think we all have moments when our identities are more um, a source of power and connection and other moments when they're a source of pain uh, and devastation. Um, and so I would say to look inward and think, is this going to be, and we can never predict either, right? Is, the, is playing this marginalization that's close to what I experience or that's similar uh, going to trigger me? Is it going to be too much for me in this moment in my life? Um, or is it going to be a way I can regain power around that identity and tell the story I want to tell for myself? And I'm not always going to share my own experiences here, but uh, for myself, I did not plan to engage in a LARP about in where the key plot for my group in the LARP was about ending slavery and in fact, not able to actually end it, but to transform it into uh, slavery light, which is indentured servitude. Um, that experience was something that at a, as a 20, 25 year old, I want to say I was not, an, you know, age is a thing, but at that time for me, I wasn't able to 
process what was going on or think about how it could be pinging my um, generational trauma. I just kind of was role playing and learning about this new community. I was overwhelmed with that aspect of things like getting everybody has two names I have to learn, you know. Um, but over time, especially through the scholarship and through presenting at Living Games and, and things, I've reflected more so on those experiences and found them to be good touchstones for me um, to learn about myself and and that history. But that's not going to be everybody's experience. Sorry, I rambled a little bit here, but I think I think the main point is yes, and I think definitely check out Janae's work. Janae Kemper has published uh, on the NordicLARP.org site, for example, about this and how to do it with care and intentionality. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a complicated <laughs> question yeah. to answer. Uh, Samantha asks, can you provide the names of the authors who write about the creative role play under curiosity and role play? I think oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure that Sarah can help, too. Um, I think uh, Tannenbaum and Tannenbaum is a good one. The Playing to Transform book was the author of that. Bowman, do you, can you throw the, yeah, the Playing to Transform? Hey, I have it here. Hold on. Nope, I didn't print the references. Um, I could throw that in the chat in a second. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can also put it in the YouTube video afterwards. Mm -hmm. So we definitely want to gather all the sources. Mm -hmm. um, Yanish is asking, can there be a risk by setting the bar so high that a pretty homogenous LARP community will have a very hard time playing any heterogeneous setting? For example, whitewashing a Western LARP because no one or few players are up for the work required to reach the level of research and immersion pointed out mm -hmm. here. Uh, and then and then he goes on to say, the story of marginalized people are not only in present in LARPs focused on their story, but also part of broader stories. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna be very blunt here and say, then the first step you need to do is to find ways to recruit more diverse voices into your community. Um, who we're going to be able to uh, provide that context um, and think about why it is, what's the intention, why is it that you want to tell that story in this particular moment in time, um, at the very least hiring consultants, um, but although I argue that just getting consultants at the last minute is the minimum that you can do and not sufficient enough. So you're, you're going to find my answer to be not, maybe not what you want to hear, but uh, I think there are other things, there's an order of operations and thinking about what it is, you know, maybe you're regionally locked in and you don't have a lot of opportunity to do this, but how can you create collaborations? I mean, we have the internet, right? Talk to communities, partner with other LARP organizations across the world. We have the ability to connect. So maybe you can't get folks um, in person at your events, but um, connect, connect, connect. Um, it should be your first, your first step. Thank you. And we have another question. What is an effective way for a marginalized person exploring their marginalization to ask for support for fellow LARPers in their goals? What is a safer way than just leaving space for exploration that a group can support this sort of play? Can you repeat the beginning of the question? Sorry, I was double uh, multitasking trying to find the, yeah, just the first bit. Okay, what is an effective way for a marginalized person exploring their marginalization to ask for support? Oh, okay. Well, so uh, I have a couple of ideas here. Um, I think that everyone, well, first of all, as a psychologist, I gotta say, I think everybody should be uh, in therapy uh, if it's accessible to you and having a therapist uh, ideally who, if not is experiencing similar marginalizations to you so they can understand and they can workshop with you. Um, somebody who is versed in uh, working with communities affected like yours. So that's the first step. Um, you know, LARP volunteers are not therapists and are not licensed to, to engage in get offering therapy or counseling. So I think that we, we need to be using these other resources as heavily as we can. However, I also would hope that your communities have staff members that you trust in the safety realm. So these could be not plot team folks, but having an additional layer of support from the community uh, in terms of uh, safety staff or player liaisons, 
seeing if those are folks you can trust to talk about this and workshop this with. A third piece that I've done in my community is to start a LARP, or in my case, and one of my marginalizations that I feel is impacted by LARP, I started a LARPer of color Facebook group for Southern California, which by the way, if you're interested in joining that, if you live in the SoCal area or LARP there, please let me know. You can contact me. Um, and so that community, we've only met in person once because then there was the pandemic, but um, it's just, it just provides a space that folks Folks can hopefully um, throw out. It's it's a con it's a confidential space where you can say I'm having this problem or I'm experiencing this or just vent about something that happens that made you feel un uncomfortable and get that validation and that support and sometimes advice on how to proceed if that's what you're interested in. So those are the three main uh, things. And then and then and then I guess I would also reinforce again, yet again, Kemper's idea of journaling before, during, and after events. And this can be especially important um, when you're portraying marginalizations that touch on your own experiences. How are you feeling? Um, what are you thinking? Who's supporting you? What feeling, what moments or experiences didn't feel so good? Um, and why was that? And is there, and, and then asking yourself, do I need to take steps to protect myself from this experience in the future? Or is this just something I want to note, observe, learn from? Um, so yeah, verily that was four things. <laughs> And I just want to add, you know, some of that writing can become a documentation piece, like yes. like Kemper's own work has become. So if you if you end up writing something that you'd like to share with the community, you know, contact us at nordiclarp.org or um, some of these other sites that might feature that, because that can also be a form of processing um, that the community can benefit. From. If if you want to share it, other yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so that's okay. one link. Casey asks, um, for a player or cast member who's interested in creating growth fostering experiences in LARP and tabletop, do you have any advice on how to steer conversations and gameplay in that direction within a scene? Hmm. Well, the first thing I would say is um, one of the principles that I pointed out towards the end was opt-in and transparency and making sure that folks know a little bit of what they're getting into and that they have the opportunity to opt out of a scene or a direction using in-game signaling. Uh, there's a lot of resources for those online. Maybe Sarah will drop some in the chat, but there are signals that you can use to say like, we need to slow down or, or lower their intensity level or bring it on, bring it up. Um, that or, or just like, I'm noping out of the scene and I am leaving. Nobody talk to me or pull me aside right now to ask how I am and cause me to do more emotional labor. So I think the first thing that you need to do is to offer those resources and tools so that people can engage, offer, I'm gonna talk slower, <laughs> offer those resources and tools so people can engage um, with trust and that they can uh, withdraw or uh, in, interact or affect the scene if they're feeling uncomfortable with the content. Uh, I think that's important. I don't think that we should be forcing this content or these experiences on anyone because that's the worst context in which people are not going to learn. I think another thing to do um, is to develop a community mindset of a growth mindset. And this, this is work by Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. Um, in general, a lot of this work has been um, looked at in the context of education, and I think it applies here. This idea that if we are engaging in a new area of learning and growth, the mindset that we're going to make mistakes, that it's not going to be perfect, and that mistakes don't signal some internal flaw or um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Taint, being tainted by the mistake, that it's going to reveal to everyone um, something um, inalterable about the self. And I think in the context of intergroup uh, relations and learning about prejudice, we often have this fear going in that we're going to reveal our unwanted biases through our engagement with the content. And the unfortunate reaction is to avoid or withdraw from those situations that make us vulnerable. So uh, not necessarily speaking to in the moment, but in the context of that community, building in that sense of like, we're hopefully we trust each other, we're aware that people make mistakes, we're going to um, not call people out in a harsh sense, but we're going to invite people to learn from their mistakes. And when we make a mistake, we're going to apologize but not force others to do the emotional labor of telling us that it's okay and absolving us of those harms we may have committed, just learning from them. 
So unfortunately, most of my answers here are about the scaffolding, right? The preparation that you can do to make those moments and scenes possible. Um, I think in the moment, it's hard to, um, to force anything to happen. Um, as a teacher, I like to think about GMing and storytelling as being very similar to running an upper level seminar class. I don't know if Sarah agrees with me at all, but this idea that, and, and Sparkles also, um, this idea that you got to over prepare and under commit, right? Like have a plan, have an intention, have a learning goal in mind figure out how you're going to get where you want to get, but also be very open to what the, in this case, uh, LARPers bring to the scene and, and not overly um, controlling of it as well. And then afterwards being prepared to debrief, whatever does happen. Definitely do wish more educators had that perspective. Uh, we have a question. Awesome talk. I find that Thank the you. thought of always including minorities in telling their own story has the practical problem that then these stories will remain a minority in the stories we tell because, yeah. well, the ones who have the right to tell these stories are a minority. So I think we should encourage minorities or majorities to tell minority stories ethically with research and respect. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I don't disagree at all. I think, I think there is a tension um, between reproducing majority stories and experiences um, if you want to avoid engaging in harms and misrepresentation. Um, and I think that the only answer to that is to including more voices of the marginalized communities in the storytelling room, in the design decisions, um, or in collaboration at the very least in consultation. And uh, there's a question, can you speak more to the idea of exploring marginalization itself through fantasy or imagined marginal mm -hmm. identities rather than real life marginal identities? Yeah, I have thoughts on this, but they're not necessarily uh, fully developed in my scholarly writing. So they're gonna be a little off the cuff and personal. I, would, I will just warn. Um, I think I wanna focus on the trope of the half elf real quick. So this is something that I had thought about uh, considering a little bit more officially, but then I realized it was a bit of maybe a niche thing that's like gets and sticks in my craw, as one might say, like a little pet peeve for me. Um, I think that this trope of playing the half elf is a uh, in a fantasy context, one who is uh, disaffected and not able to be loved by either side of their family or and or works to bring the communities together um, is a very common role that a lot of people gravitate towards, but I think that it can be problematic in that because we're not aware that we're basically portraying a mixed mixed race or bicultural experience because it's just a fantasy story, people can slip into engaging in harmful portrayals of uh, tropes such as, and I'm going to say a word right now that is not a word that you should use, but it's considered uh, the, the mulatto trope is the academic term for it. And uh, this is a harmful word that is a slur when used to address an individual. Um, so just to flag that, but this idea that mixed race or bicultural people are uh, inherently trauma traumatized and uh, um, placeless uh, is not is a harmful stereotype uh, that is rooted in some real lived experiences, but is also rooted in practices of media portrayals that were um, very much circumscribed by laws and governing bodies like the Hayes Code. So we got to be careful when we're um, saying like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to explore this neat idea in fantasy and think and just take a second to think like, what's my intention with that? And what real world identities and experiences could this be um, portraying? However, I will say that I think that it's much uh, healthy, healthier for communities, maybe, I don't know, I might sign on to that, um, to portray marginalized experiences, especially your first time trying it, um, not in a real world context. I'm not saying you can never do it, but I think that there is something that like that step removed does allow us to um, engage a little bit more playfully, reduce some of the anxieties and reduce some of the harms. But I don't think that the harms are completely mitigated by that. Is that getting at, do we think that's getting at the question? Kind of talked around it a bit. I think it's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think in your talk, you had mentioned that it can be a, a benefit actually to have this fantasy um, one step away 
Um, and yes. so that yeah. may, that may have been the intention of the, yeah. the person asking, mm -hmm. like, because you're, you're mentioning now how it can actually be really close, uh, mm -hmm. even when not intentionally. So, yeah. um, but, um, perhaps maybe talking a little bit about the beneficial aspects. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's got, uh, it's got both. I think there is a benefit to, or at least you're avoiding the harms of portraying directly, um, an oppressed culture. And especially like Kelly Lynn D'Angelo said, I want to amplify her voice, uh, that there are some cultures who are so oppressed and erased today that it's, like only under very specific circumstances of lots of research connection with the community going out to the community visiting them and maybe even um dedicating yourself to helping that community in real life in uh either through your your consumer dollars or or better yet through activism um only under those conditions should we portray real lived experiences of marginalization that are that rough um that's uh so-called i think i forget what kai said but um close to home and of oppressed groups so yeah in that sense i'm kind of talking more about like what you get away from when you do the fantasy version or the futuristic version um but i think that that's an important piece of the benefit of that i also I also want to harness again Octavia Butler's kind of energy because she wrote a lot of um, futuristic post-apocalyptic or science fiction. She kind of helped to kick off Afrofuturism. And a lot of that is saying like when we imagine worlds other than our own, we're able to uh, change the world. And so I think that that's, that's really powerful. Great, great. Uh, we have a question from a design point of view. How do we accommodate for the potential dissonance of triple consciousness with the added complexity of yes. a character? Or is that quadruple consciousness? <laughs> Much like yeah. working in a second language, is there a structural imbalance here? And if so, how do we acknowledge it? I think that's absolutely true from personal experience. If I'm juggling uh, being immersed in character um, and maybe experiencing some or worried about some marginalization, it's hard to uh, make ch choices. I mean, I may not even be making choices actively, but just engaging in fluid role play without steering. Um, it's difficult to uh, maintain all of that in one's mind. I think that I'm going to cite myself here because I have a paper um, um, where I look at the neuroscience of bleed. And in this case, uh, bleed is the spillover between, between player and character. And we can talk about how um, bleed can be something that we want. And then we, and that's how we can learn from role play by allowing what we experience in game to spill over into our everyday lives. Um, but sometimes bleed is unintended. Um, and this can be uh, where, you know, for example, we can have a hostile interaction in character, and then we no longer like that person out of character or, uh, or other things like that, or out of character, we don't get along. And then in character, we're not able to portray the, the relationship in a positive way as one very basic example. And um, in my paper, that maybe Sarah will throw in the chat, the citation. Um, <laughs> yes, um, or the link to my, uh, yeah. Um, so in that paper, I just talk about how uh, managing bleed, if you do choose to do that, if you do choose to steer, um, to control where a story is going, for example, like Janae Kemper talks about, um, then we would uh, expect that would have a cost cognitively and emotionally. And so there's a really great body of research primarily by Roy Baumeister and Mark Leary and Diane Tice and others um, in social psychology, looking at how uh, this model suggests that we have a limited pool of cognitive resources every day that we use for self-control purposes. Um, so, and this is why this resource can run out at the end of the day when we make a lot of choices, engage in a lot of self-presentation, um, switch modes a lot. So you can hear already how this is exactly the kind of thing that LARP is going to deplete. Um, and so um, that's why at the end of the day, after like a tough work day, maybe you reach for that extra piece of cake or you snap at your partner because you're just out of these cognitive self-control resources. Um, and uh, what we need to think about as a community is how we can um, be intentional with how we use each other's cognitive resources, right? So how, how much are we demanding our players engage in self-presentation and code switching and um, emotion regulation 
And is it necessary for the story that we're telling? I'm not saying don't do these things. Obviously, LARP, I love intense RP, um, but make sure that it's guided, it's intentional, and it's it's happening for a reason. Like, don't make people run up a hill five times in a row with like a high altitude, unless that's going to serve the story, is basically what I'm saying. And then um, additionally, at the end of that, how can we rebuild those resources, both over time by, you know, one of the cool things about it, I know like, transformation is the theme of this this whole thing over time i argue that by engaging in larping and engaging in this use of these resources we're building our self control ability that can spill out into our everyday lives make us better uh, partners better friends maybe better in our work whatever your goals are um, but also on in the moment, how can we recover resources we've spent? And so this can be as simple. There's some really funny research out there that suggests like drinking a lemonade, like staying, um, having your glucose, your sugar levels maintained actually affects this. Um, so there's a biological substrate involved, but also um, more psychological mechanisms of replacing our cognitive um, self-control resources include um, things like uh, laughing, humor. And I'm a big fan of that kind of like, um, so my partner's father was a, an, is, was an Episcopalian priest, and he had this, I'm sure, borrowed concept of storytelling because priests tell stories as for a living, right? That's what a homily is. And this was um, uh, make them laugh, make them cry, make them think right? Like this trio. And I think that laughter and humor is a hugely important part of being able to get people into a space where they can expect um, these so-called negative emotional experiences. Um, this emo that, that other, that folks in LARP scholarship have talked about this sort of chosen emotional negative experience that can lead to learning, but can be really rough um, and that people can steer out of because they're afraid of it. Well, if you make your players trust that you're going to take care of them emotionally and you're going to give them those moments of release. Um, not only will that make them more brave in their storytelling and role play, but also it will buy back some of that um, emotional cost that you've incurred so that they can, to get back to the original question, so that they can um, make sure that they're managing this quadruple um, consciousness that you referenced. I have one more question and yeah. two minutes. So speed that was long-winded, sorry. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. Thanks. How can a player navigate the complexity of their own and others' intersectional identities when portraying yeah. marginalized characters, especially in a setting with fantasy or supernatural elements, where the same type of character may be interpreted as an allegory for several parallel or intersecting mm -hmm. experiences of a real-world oppression? Yeah, that's a big one for two minutes. I'm just going to throw out a couple of uh, practices that I think are really important when you get into these complex portrayals. Um, I and, and you know it's kind of related to what I said, like scaffolding, in game, being aware, and then post game debriefing. I'll start at the end. I think that I've seen a lot of communities have good intentions when going into storytelling, and then members of the community with intersectionality um, interpret the meaning of the story or the portrayal in a way that was not expected by the author. And you know what? That's just the way that art goes. You can't, once you, once you put something out in the world, you cannot control how it is received, but you can speak to the community. You can, again, trust is like the huge thing that I, I'm saying here. If people trust you as a storyteller, then they're going to be more curious about your choices rather than um, immediately harmed or, you know, um, getting the pitchforks out. So I think that communicating early on often and after the fact about your intention with your storytelling, guiding principles. As teachers, we need to have a teaching philosophy philosophy usually made available publicly. I think we need more designers to do that. Um, and so to have kind of to develop that trust. So like going to the middle again, um, I think that a lot of folks, it, at least in my communities, will give short shrift to the prep of their cast members. I know, I know we recently talked about maybe not having cast members at all. And that's a whole other conversation, but making sure to convey the, not just the beats of the story, but what is the energy you're trying to portray? And what are some concerns about how this might be interpreted? And to think about that in advance. And then going back to the beginning, intentionality, learning objectives. Um, I'll, I'll share with Sarah that article that got me inspired to write the SoCal Railroad LARP. Um, I think that just like all throughout intentionality all the way through um, and recruiting folks to be involved in your stories that you trust to also um, be thinking in this complex way. That's it. 
And for those of you who um, are out of breath just listening to Diana, sorry, <laughs> her brain is amazing. Um, I we will be transcribing everything, and it'll be in the video afterwards, so you can you know rewatch it uh, at your leisure. Well, thank you so much thank you, for folks. this wonderful uh, time. Yeah. And for all of your incredible questions. And um, it was just, it was just so wonderful to not only hear your theory, but also hear about your experiences and your design work and, and how that's evolved. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I know this is tricky and there aren't easy answers to yeah. any of this. So yeah. I feel Absolutely. like you covered the nuances really, really well. So thank, thank you. Thank so you. I really enjoyed the questions and having this conversation. And um, I'm really excited about this program you're developing and to attend all the other talks in the series. They sound really great. Wonderful. All right, everyone. Um, we will see you next time. Our next talk will be from Jaco Stenros, um, and he will be talking about play, uh, which his dissertation is about. Um, so-called so positive and so-called negative aspects of play. So mm -hmm. very similar to this, but more uh, broad in a sense. Yeah, and I was re referencing uh, Yakov when I mentioned about getting to that like positive, that learning from our negative emotional experiences and, and that some people might wanna shy away from those. Um, and we wanna provide a space where they feel comfortable doing that with the you know mechanics, but also that they feel safe pushing the envelope there. Yeah. Um, yeah, we when... will be announcing it tomorrow, uh, but uh, for this exclusive, <laughs> I believe it is October 10th. Is that right, Sparkles and Leela? Uh, sorry, October 12th. So we're trying to do these on Tuesday nights and stay consistent, uh, and that's daytime for those in the U.S. and um, yeah. evenings for for us in Europe, and very late, unfortunately, for people in uh, other in other parts of the world, but. Um, yes, uh, Tuesday, October 12th, and we will, we will be uh, sharing that with you tomorrow. Yeah, a special thanks to anybody who joined from uh, a time zone that wasn't friendly to their sleep patterns. I appreciate you for being here. We definitely <laughs> have some people who have registered from Singapore. I don't know if they're currently mm -hmm. here, but um, they are, they're very engaged in what we're doing. So shout out to the Singaporeans. And now they're talking about Yako's. Um, yeah, I saw that. So this is where we kick you out of the room because the talk is over. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.